meeting of the Administrative Reg Review Subcommittee will come to order. Will the Secretary please call the roll? Senator Rocky Adams. Here. Senator Thayer. Here. Senator Gates. Here. Representative Bridges. Here. Representative Fraser Gordon. Here. Representative Grossberg. Senator West. Here. Representative Lewis. Here. We have a quorum. First matter of business is approval of the minutes. Are there any additions or corrections? Seeing none, we have a motion. Is there a second? Second. Without objection, it's so ordered. Please call the first regulation. We are going to begin with Board of Pharmacy 201 KAR 2380 Emergency. 201 KR 2380 E amends to delete the list of specific conditions with board authorized protocols and permit the board to establish provider approved protocols as deemed appropriate by the board to permit a more rapid response to public health emergencies. Would you please identify yourself for the record? Good morning, Chris Harlow, Executive Director. Eden Davis, General Counsel. Thank you. Do you have anything to present to the committee? Uh, no, I think we were asked uh, just to provide update, and I don't know that we have any additional update other than um, since the last hours we've been working in good faith with KMA to address the concerns with the ordinary regulation, which the ordinary regulation would replace the E-reg. Gotcha. Um, I'm going to take a brief pause with you guys, and we got a couple speakers here. We have Ben Mudd. He wants to come forward. And then we'll have uh, Corey Meadows, you're on deck. If you would state your name for the record and proceed. Sure. Good morning. My name is uh, Ben Mudd, Executive Director of the Kentucky Pharmacists Association. Uh, here this morning really to, to speak in favor of board authorized protocols. Um, I, I know that uh, there was some conversation in the last hours meeting on the ordinary regulation, and it sounds like the, the board uh, pharmacy has worked with KMA to, to uh, address that regulation. We've also met with KMA and uh, are supportive of putting the list of authorized conditions back into the regulation. Um, but again, just wanted to briefly um, show our support for board authorized protocols uh, and, and their effectiveness to help Kentucky patients. Um, one thing I, I want to review is that, that pharmacists are uh, educated and qualified to provide this protocol driven care. Um, pharmacists go through extensive education. As many of you may know, uh, every pharmacist that, that practices in the state uh, has a doctorate level degree. Uh, we go to school for seven to eight years in order to provide care to our patients. Uh, in that training, we get uh, we we are we receive education on how to assess patients. Uh, we also receive extensive education on when is an appropriate time to refer patients to to seek uh, care from from a primary care physician or uh, through through emergency care. Uh, and and that leads really to what the protocols are are meant to do, and that is to provide safe and effective care uh, to the appropriate patients in Kentucky. So if you, if you take you know, a moment to look at each of the protocols that have been approved thus far, uh, each of them include exclusion uh, and inclusion criteria. So that, that tells the pharmacist, here are the appropriate pa patients that, that you should pr be providing care for, and here are, are the exclusion criteria. The, these are the, the list of things that if a patient um, should, should not receive this type of care, and in the protocol, they all go on to say that if the patient meets that exclusion criteria, that we must refer them to primary care. If they don't have primary care, if they don't have a primary care physician, which a lot of these patients that are using this don't have, that we would have to refer them to, to ER if it's an emergency situation or, or urgent care. Um, so far to date, there have been no complaints of, of safety issues or harm to patients from these protocols. Um, and, and last, I'll say that these protocols are collaborative in nature. Uh, they, they, every one of them requires a signature from a prescriber that is licensed in Kentucky, and that could be either a nurse practitioner 
or, uh, or a physician. So by that, these protocols would not be in use if there weren't prescribers out there that are working with pharmacies to allow pharmacists to provide protocol-driven care. Um, the last thing I'll, I'll say is, you know, we, as a profession, want to continue uh, to collaborate with all parties on this, uh, and, and we will continue to work. But I appreciate you all taking the time to, to just listen, and hopefully this has helped provide some, oversight or some overview of what these protocols can do to, to help your constituents and, and our patients. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, Corey, if you would come forward. State your name for the record, please proceed. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the record. My name is Corey Meadows, and I'm Director of Advocacy for the Kentucky Medical Association, and I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you because I know last month we were here, we had significant concerns about uh, the emergency regulation as well as the ordinary regulation. So we do want to provide you an update I can confirm uh, that since our last meeting, the Board of Pharmacy uh, has reached out to us to talk about uh, changes to the ordinary reg. Uh, we have reviewed those changes and I will uh, can confirm that it has started to address uh, our concerns with the ordinary regulation. Uh, as a reminder, we had issues with things like education and training being removed from the regulation. Uh, we had issues, significant issues, with removing the list of conditions uh, from, uh, from, from the protocols and from the regulation uh, so that we would not have any idea of what protocols they were even developing. And so uh, I think that the Board of Pharmacy has attempted to address that. What I will say, however, is that I think we have uh, lingering concerns uh, going forward about process and about substance. Uh, let's take the process uh, first. If these protocols remained uh, are allowed to be done via regulation. Uh, our concern is, is after the board changes um, and after this committee changes, uh, there's nothing that would prohibit uh, a future board of pharmacy from removing the list of conditions again uh, or removing the education and training. Uh, and because of that, we think that there should be a better process if these protocols are going to exist. Um, Substantively, yeah, there are things being done via protocols that we do have issues with that we don't think is necessarily appropriate uh, at the pharmacy counter. And so what we are proposing, because as a reminder, even though the ordinary regulation is being proposed to be changed substantially back the way it was, there's an, an emergency reg currently in existence uh, where there is no list of conditions and no education and training. And I think that is, that is an issue. And I think that's an example of why this is a process problem. So what we are proposing, and we've reached out to the Board of Pharmacy, and I think Mr. Harlow has, has given us a, a pretty firm commitment to sit down with us. Uh, and we've also asked the Pharmacists Association, we had a good meeting last week, waiting to hear back from them on whether they would agree to do this. But we want to sit down uh, as soon as possible, but, but it may carry over into the interim as well, about how we how we deal with this process, protocol process going forward. It's our opinion that protocols, any that are going to be done, uh, should be put in statute and allow the General Assembly to have some say on what is done via these, uh, um, these, these protocols. And so that's the kind of conversation that we want to have uh, because physicians are education, educated and trained as well. Uh, and in fact, we think they're as educated and as trained at the highest level. And so they should have some say in this. And we think sitting down and talking about what can and should be done via protocols is, is a worthy conversation. And whatever those are should be put in statute so that we don't, we can avoid the problem that we've experienced over the last several months. We can avoid that in the future. So I hope that update is helpful to you. Happy to answer any questions. And you certainly have our commitment to continue working with the Board of Pharmacy as well as the Pharmacy Association uh, to get a better process in place. Thank you. Thank you. Co-Chair Lewis has a question, I believe. Yes, this is for uh, Mr. Harlow. Um, you know, being in pharmacy, I, I don't, in none of my stores do any of the authorized protocols. Um, the reason for the emergency regulation, is, is this tied to billing at all on the Medicaid side? 
Yes, that is correct. So pharmacists, um, under, the, under, under the federal PREP Act, pharmacists can prescribe Paxlovid. And so we, we were contacted by Department of Medicaid Services because pharmacists are not able to bill if they prescribe. So they asked if we could have a board authorized protocol in place in order to, to have some sort of DMS statewide protocol that pharmacists could use for the purpose of being able to bill for that service and Medicaid recipients being able to receive Paxlovid by, by pharmacy providers. And so we were, we were contacted after the amendment of the ordinary regulation, which is why we had to um, put forward the emergency regulation under the amended version. But since, just, just to be clear, you know, the board made it clear that we would not do any additional board authorized protocols outside of Paxlovid until the ordinary regulation was in full effect. So we, there was never any intent to do any additional board authorized protocols outside of Paxlovid. Good. Any other questions from members? I've got a couple. Um, this question is for Mr. Meadows. So, um, could you be precise on what you're looking for? It, it appears, you know, the KMA is looking for something that that's not not here. It's not this E-Reg. And so would that be keeping the protocols the same, adding Paxlovid to that list of protocols, and then keeping the education requirement? Is that kind of where? Yeah, I think more immediately. We we kind of describe it as we got uh, to put it in medical terms. We've we've got an emergent issue, which is you know when you would go to the ER to be treated, and we have a chronic condition, which is the long-term solution, right? And so more immediately, the reg that you have in front of you, uh, we certainly are encouraged that it has been uh, the proposal is to take it back to substantially the way it was, reinserting the education and training reinserting the list of conditions. I understand that there's now an addition uh, for, for Plaxovid, uh, but, but also it keeps in place the registry uh, that was proposed as well as a protocol committee. Uh, that is certainly substantially in much better form than what the E-Reg, uh, the way the E-Reg is operating currently. Uh, but that's the more immediate problem and, and our folks have said, you know, if we've got to have the reg, that certainly looks a lot better. And so we defer to the committee on what to do on the ordinary regulation. But again, I, I want to emphasize that there's a long-term problem as well. We think that these types of protocols should not be subject to regulation. Um, and so, and, and, and instead, we think that it should be put in the statute. And that's, there, there's precedent for that. Uh, the, the, there's statutes on the books talking about doing vaccinations via uh, protocols. Uh, and that's fine because the General Assembly has signed off on that. Um, and so we think any protocol should be done, uh, be put in the list of conditions that are subject to protocols should be put in statute. And that'll take a legislative change. So we think that's the long-term solution. In order to do that, I think you need to hear from us and the Board of Pharmacy and the Pharmacists Association on which uh, conditions are appropriate for protocols. And that's why that's a long-term conversation that we have to have. I hope that helps, Mr. Chairman. I just, I just want to express that there's both a short-term issue and what we think is a process problem that needs to be worked out uh, through, through statute uh, and conversations around that. Point taken, um, but it appears that it's your opinion, and the, the Board of Pharmacy can jump in at any time, but you all have been working in good faith, and, and Absolutely. everybody appears to be on, on the same page. Absolutely, and we appreciate that. I do want to publicly say we appreciate those efforts. Thank you. You have a question? Senator yeah, Adams. Just a clarification. It sounds like to me what has been stated is that there are ongoing conversations relative to a, a regulation, a, an ordinary regulation, but that this E-reg is an insertion of something that is still problematic. Am I? That is correct. Yes. Okay. The, the, the E-reg is has no list of conditions. Right. The E-Reg has no education and, and training. And that, yeah, that is a significant, those remain significant concerns for the KMA. Yes. Yeah, and I guess my, my comment would be, let's, if the conversations are happening, um, let's let that play out um, between those parties that, um, that I think want to get to an agreement um, rather than deal with this e-reg today. 
I have an opinion on that, Senator Adams. I'll let you know it here in a second. But uh, <laughs> um, any other questions from members? Um, so we have two two situations. We have the ongoing discussion between between you all, and then what we have to concern ourselves with here is the procedure and process of the reg committee, mm -hmm. and so. Uh, it's very important that if if the legislature is going to have a say on this issue that it has to be now this meeting because this is the last meeting before the end of session and so rather than personally and this is my opinion i don't want to see this hanging out there um while discussions are going on and without you all knowing the full intent of the legislature so at this time, I'm going to make a motion for deficiency on KR 2380E. Is there a second? We have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion on the motion? Seeing none. All those in favor of finding the regulation deficient will vote aye. Those opposed will vote no. Please call the roll. Senator Rocky Adams. Aye. Senator Thayer. Aye. Senator Yates. Representative Bridges. Representative, oh, thank you, pardon me. Uh, Representative Fraser Gordon. Yes. Representative Grossberg. Nay. Senator West. Aye. And Representative Lewis. Aye. Um, the we the motion does carry to find the regulation deficient. Thank you. Um, is there any comment? I'm gonna go ahead. I was just hoping you could clarify, uh, you know, under KRS 13A.030, what subsection your finding of deficiency is based on. We could do 11. Um, we could do one. Uh, six. Eight. So those four could be under those four. Okay. Thank you. And so just as a little bit of guidance, um, there, there is the ordinary reg that's hanging out there. You know, and that, that's continuing to go through the process. Hopefully, sounds like you guys are on the path to come to, to some sort of, of agreement. Um, and, and so as far as the providers go, um, I, I think you all can resolve this fairly quickly. And the main intent is to not take this outside of the regulatory process, but to keep it in the regulatory process and then do that first. And then, as Mr. Meadows stated, if, if we want to put this in the statute later, that's a whole, a whole other question. We're not even, get, we're not even there yet. Um, but that's the intent of this committee is, is that, you know, these remain in the regulatory process and not, the pharmacy board doesn't become kind of a fiefdom to itself to, to look at these issues, so. Any other questions? Thank you. Please call next regulation. Department of Veterans Affairs, 17 KAR 3020 with amendment. 17 KAR 3020 amends to remove the maximum monthly resident charges and dollar amounts and replace it with a methodology for establishing charges, which incorporates several factors. The staff amendment amends various sections for clarity and to comply with KRS Chapter 13A. Would you please identify yourself for the record? Proceed. Good morning. I'm Tamara Reed McIntosh. I am the Executive Director of the Office of Veteran Legal Services with KDVA. My name is Mark Bowman. I'm the Executive Director of the Office of Kentucky Veterans Center. I'm Walt Renault. I'm the Deputy Commissioner, Kentucky Department of Veterans Affairs. Thank you. There's a staff amendment. Do we have a motion for approval of the staff amendment? Second. We have a motion. We have a second. Without objection, it's so ordered. Any questions from members 
of the committee on this set of regs. Seeing none, please call the next regulation. Thank you. Thank you. Auditor of Public Accounts, 45 KAR 1030 without additional amendments. This regulation is being amended to replace the audit guide for sheriff's tax settlements with the audit program for sheriff's tax settlements, make auditing procedures and report formats conform to the regulatory basis of accounting and auditing standards, and update references. Would you please identify yourself for the record? Hi, good morning. I'm Farrah Petter, the Assistant State Auditor. I'm Graham Gray. I'm General Counsel. Thank you. There are no amendments on this set of regs. Any questions from members of the committee? Seeing none, please call the next set of regulations. Thank you. Finance and Administration Cabinet, Kentucky Retirement Systems, 105 KAR 1001 and 1365, both with staff suggested amendments. 1001 establishes definitions for 105 KAR Chapter 1. 1365 establishes the procedures and requirements for the hybrid cash balance plan tier. The staff amendments amend various sections to comply with drafting and formatting requirements of KRS Chapter 13A. Would you please identify yourself for the record? Carrie Bash, Staff Attorney Supervisor, Kentucky Public Pensions Authority. Jessica Bobian, Policy Specialist, Kentucky Public Pensions Authority. Thank you. There are staff amendments. Is there a motion for approval of staff amendments? We have a motion and a second without objection is so ordered. Any questions on this set of regulations from KRS? Seeing none, please call the next regulation. Thank you. Board of Veterinary Examiners, 201 KAR 16, 550, 552, 560, 562, 572, all with staff suggested amendments, and 610. 201 KR 16550 amends to add definitions, require an animal control agency to submit a form to request a new designated on site manager, allow the board to accept a local employment background check, authorize the board to conduct closeout inspections of expired drugs, delete sections of approved drugs, insert inspection requirements, and update material incorporated by reference. 201 KR 16552 establishes requirements for drugs and procedures relating to animal euthanasia at certified animal control agencies. 201 KR 16560 amends to remove sections 8 and 9 describing the duties of an animal euthanasia specialist and improve methods of euthanasia that have been moved to another regulation. Will require completion of a board training course within 12 months prior to application. Spe specify euthanasia training relates to euthanasia by injection. Direct course providers to report an attendee's absence of, of more than 15 minutes. Allow the board to accept local employment background check results and update material incorporated by reference. 201 KR 16562 establishes the duties and responsibilities of an animal euthanasia specialist, animals, drugs, and methods approved for euthanasia, the prohibition against practicing veterinary medicine, and a provision for disciplinary action. 201 KR 16572 amends to require an animal control agency to identify each associated animal euthanasia specialist, allow the board to accept a local background check results, authorize an online request to change a name or address and update forms. 201 KR 16610 amends to rename the Complaints Screening Committee to the Grievance Committee, remove the requirement that the board chair screen every potential grievance, grant credential holders 20 days to respond to a written grievance or to a notice of an administrative hearing, and update material incorporated by reference. The staff amendments for 201 KR 16550, 552, 560, 562, and 572 all make changes for clarity and to comply with KRS Chapter 13A. Would you please identify yourself for the record? Michelle Shane, Executive Director for the Board. Uh, Dr. John Park, uh, if you could. Dr. John Park, veterinarian, uh, board member. Welcome. Long trip over from Bourbon County. Good to see you. You too. Um, there are staff amendments. Is there a motion for approval of the staff amendments? We have a motion and a second without objection. It is so ordered. Uh, any questions from members? I have no questions, just a comment. I've found another job in life that I don't ever want to do. Animal euthanasia specialist. <laughs> that's, that's tough. Um, 
but very, very depressing. Uh, no, seeing no questions, please call the next regulation. Thank you. Thank you. Good to see you. Board of Physical Therapy, 201 KAR 22170 with staff suggested amendment. This regulation is being amended to update the dates of the physical therapy compact rules. The staff suggested amendment amends section two to comply with the drafting requirements of KRS chapter 13A. Please identify yourself for the record. Uh, my name is Stephen Curley. I'm the executive director with the Kentucky Board of Physical Therapy. There's a staff amendment. Is there a motion for approval of the staff amendment? We have a motion. Second. We have a second without objection is so ordered. Any questions from members? Seeing none, please call the next regulation. Thank you. Thank you. Board of Social Work, 201 KER 23051 with staff suggested amendment. 201 KR 23051 establishes a definition of licensee, the requirements for the renewal, termination, and reinstatement of a license, and the application for renewal form. The admitted after comments version includes methods for applying for renewal, reinstatement, and how terminations are handled, clarifies definitions, separates each section and provides a better description, reorders sections, clarifies items, allows for new sections within the re regulation and provides clarification with a new title and additional information related to the title of that section and updates material incorporated by reference. The staff amendment amends various sections to comply with CARES Chapter 13A. Would you please identify yourself for the record? Mark Kelly, Executive Director of the Kentucky Board of Social Work. Thank you. There's a staff amendment. Do we have a motion? We have a motion and a second without objection is so ordered. Any questions from members? Seeing none, please call the next regulation. Thank you. Thank you. Board of Emergency Medical Services, 202 KAR 7, 201, 301, and 330 with staff suggested amendments, and 401, 555, and 601 without additional amendments. 202 KR 7201, 301, and 330 all amend to conform to requirements of the EREMT relating to the minimum age requirement and certain educational requirements. Delete the pre enrollment background check and clarify that only the NREMT continuing competency, competency program for continuing education is required for certification, renewal, and reinstatement. The staff amendments all make changes to comply with CARES Chapter 13A. 7401 is being amended to bring the requirements for paramedic licensure into conformity with the requirements of the National Registry of Emergency Medical Technicians, remove the requirement of a pre-enrollment background check, clarify that only the national component of the continued competency program for paramedic continuing education is required for licensure, renewal, and reinstatement, and remove the requirement that proof of current NREMT certification and proof of certain training be provided when a paramedic downgrades his or her license. 7555 establishes a minimum response time for non-emergency calls and permits assistance from other agencies when the minimum response time cannot be met. 7601 is being amended to clarify EMS TEI requirements, reduce EMS TEI pass rate requirements to help avoid disciplinary actions, align psychomotor skill testing requirements with the requirements of the National Registry, allow assistant instructors to teach up to 40% of courses to mitigate the shortage of EMS educators, remove minimum patient contact requirements to allow EMS educators to determine student competency on an individual basis and avoid delays in student certification or licensure, allow 100% of courses to be conducted online as permitted by the National Registry, remove the student teaching requirements, remove unnecessary or redundant documentation requirements, and allow the board to recognize and approve equivalent educator certifications from other U.S. states and territories. Would you please identify yourself for the record? Uh, John Wood, outside counsel for the Kentucky Board of EMS. Eddie Sloan, Kentucky Board of EMS. There are staff amendments. Is there a motion for approval of staff amendments? Motion. We have a motion and a second. Without objection, is so ordered. Any questions from members? Seeing none, please call the next regulation. Thank, Thank you. you. Tourism Arts and Heritage Cabinet, Department of Fish and Wildlife Resources, 301 KAR 2, 245, and 3120, both with staff suggested amendments. 2245 establishes the requirements for the recovery and removal of certain portions of big game animals and upland game birds and establishes the rules for carcass disposal. 3120 is being amended to improve training requirements for nuisance wildlife control operators, limit movement of rabies vector species, require dispatch of exotic species, and clarify the legal use of poison on wildlife. 
The staff suggests amendments to these regulations amends various sections to comply with the drafting and formatting requirements of KRS Chapter 13A and make technical changes. Would you please identify yourself for the record? Stephen Fields, staff attorney. Brian Clark, deputy commissioner for the department. Thank you. There are staff amendments. Is there a motion for approval of staff amendments? Second. We have a motion and a second without objection. It's so ordered. Any questions from members? Seeing none, please call the next regulation. Thank you. Thank you. Justice and Public Safety Cabinet, Department of Corrections, 501 KAR 6040 with staff suggested amendment. This regulation amends to update the policies and procedures of Kentucky State Penitentiary, including policies on missing or stolen inmate property, restrictive housing unit, special security unit, health care, and inmate visiting and correspondence. The staff suggests an amendment amends various sections and the material incorporated by reference to align provisions with other departmental policies and to comply with 13A drafting requirements. If you would, please identify yourself for the record. Good morning, Amy Barker, Assistant General Counsel here for the Department of Corrections. Brandon Lynch, Admin Branch Manager, Kentucky Department of Corrections. Thank you. There are staff amendments. Is there a motion for approval? There's a motion. Is there a second? <laughs> Where's Mary Lou Marzian? We need her. There's a motion and a second. Would you like me to just start randomly yelling, Mr. Chairman? <laughs> A second would be fine. Just <laughs> There's a motion and a second without objection. So ordered. Any questions? Seeing none, please call the next regulation. Thank you. Thank you. Education and Labor Cabinet, Department of Education, 701 KAR 8, 010, 020, 030, 040, and 050. Uh, all except 030 and 050 have staff suggested amendments. 704 KAR 3303 without additional amendments, 704 KAR 8120 with staff suggested amendment, and 707 KAR 1002 um, with a staff suggested amendment. 701-8010 establishes the public charter school student application lottery and enrollment process. 701-8020 establishes the requirements for the competence report performance and evaluation for charter school authorizers. 701-8030 establishes requirements for the appeals process. 701-8040 establishes requirements for conversion public charter schools. 701-8050 establishes the requirements for the calculation and distribution of funds to a public charter school the schedule of the distri distribution of funds, and the fines for failure to timely transfer funds. The staff suggested amendments to these regulations amends various sections to comply with the drafting requirements of KRS Chapter 13A, correct statutory citations, and make technical changes. 704-3303 is being amended to update the material incorporated by reference to remove the standards incorporated by reference in 704-KR-8120. 704-8120 establishes the minimum contact requirements of KRS 1586453 to be met by a student pursuant to the Kentucky Academic Standards for Science. The staff suggested amendment to 704-8120 amends the necessity, function, and conformity paragraph for clarity. 707-1002 is being amended to remove provisions inconsistent with the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act and the guidance of the official Office of Special Education Programs. The staff suggest amendment amends the statutory authority paragraph to add a statutory citation and section one to comply with the drafting requirements of KRS chapter 13A and make technical changes. Would you please identify yourself for the record? Good morning, Todd Allen, General Counsel for the State Board of Education and Department of Education. Mickey Ray, Chief Academic Officer. Matthew Courtney, Policy Advisor. Matt Ross, Policy Advisor. Thank you. There are staff amendments. Is there a motion for approval of the staff amendments? We have a motion and a second without objection. It is so ordered. Any questions from members on this set of regulations? Okay, I've got one question. I'm assuming these are in relation to House Bill 9 and just a you know, reaction to that, what, what you're tasked with doing at KDE. Is that correct? Yes, the uh, regulations in the 701 um, title are in response to House Bill 9. There are emergency regulations that were filed and are already in place. Um, these ordinary regulations are um, identical to the emergency regulations that are in place and will uh, 
the, the emergency regulations will expire and these will take their place. But all of the amendments are in response to uh, changes to the law made in House Bill 9 from the previous legislative session. Thank you so much. I have no further questions. Anyone else? Seeing none, please call the next regulation. Thank you. Office of Unemployment Insurance, 787 KAR 1090 Emergency and 100 Emergency. Neither of these have additional amendments. 1090 Emergency is being amended to update requirements in compliance with KRS 341-350 requiring that unemployment claimants report work search activities each week for which a claim for benefits has been made, specify the type of activities that qualify as work search activities, and require the unemployment claimant to certify work search activities under the penalty of perjury as verification. 1-100 emergency is being amended to add the statutory exception to the definition of week of unemployment for any week in which a claimant receives shared work benefits in compliance with KRS 341-080. Would you please identify yourself for the record? I'm Matt Lynch. I'm a staff attorney at the Education and Labor Cabinet Workforce Development uh, Legal Division. Warren McFarland, Deputy General Counsel, Education and Labor Cabinet. Thank you. There are no amendments. Are there any questions from members? Seeing none, please call the next regulation. Thank you. Thank you all. Public Protection Cabinet, Department of Insurance, 806 KAR 3250 with staff suggested amendment. 806 3250 establishes the process for an insurance related license compliance <laughs> with cybersecurity requirements and an eligible insurance related licensee to file a cybersecurity exemption form. The staff suggested amendment amends various sections to comply with KRS Chapter 13A. Would you please identify yourself for the record? Yes, Abigail Gull, Department of Insurance. I can't hear myself, so can you hear me? Not. <laughs> is, the, is the light on? It was not. There you go. Okay. All right. <laughs> Abigail Gull, um, Department of Insurance. Thank you. Thank you. Sean Ormer, Executive Div Advisor, Department of Insurance. Thank you. There's a staff amendment. Is there a motion for approval? We have a motion. We have a second without objection. So ordered. Any questions from members? this set of regs seeing none please call the next regulation thank, thank you thank you cabinet for health and family services under public health we have 902 kar 2470 and under office of the inspector general 902 kar 2490 emergency uh, there are no additional amendments 902 KR 2470 establishes the application process for a hospital to be recognized in the statewide system for heart attack response and treatment. 902 2490 emergency establishes minimum standards for licensure as a rural emergency hospital. Would you please identify yourself for the record? Julie Brooks, Regulations Coordinator for the Department for Public Health. Adam Mather, Inspector General for the Cabinet. Kara Daniel, Deputy Inspector General. Thank you so much. There are no amendments on these regs. However, we do um, have a speaker, uh, Alex Kuhn. If uh, if you all could make, if you, if you all could. We're going to pass on our comments. Okay. Thank you. Fair enough. Any questions from members? Seeing none, please call the next regulation. Thank you. Thank you. Department for Medicaid Services, 907 KAR 130038 Emergency, without additional amendment. 907 1038 Emergency amends Medicaid program hearing provisions to remove the age limit of 21 and the physician referral requirement. Pursuant to KRS 138.030, subsection 2, paragraph A, this administrative regulation was found deficient at the February 14th meeting of this subcommittee. Committee will stand at ease for one moment.
I apologize for the delay. Um, would you please identify yourself for the record? Lisa Lee, Commissioner, Kentucky Department for Medicaid Services. Jonathan Scott, Red Coordinator, DMS. Thank you. There are no amendments. Uh, are there any questions or comments from members? Co-Chair Lewis. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you all for being here today. Um, I've got a, a dentist back home that reached out to me after our, our last meeting where we did find um, the regulations deficient. And they had a question on rates and, and, and us finding, um, you know, it deficient. You know, I just think there needs to be clarity. There is nothing prohibiting you all from negotiating new rates uh, with MCOs and new fee schedules. Um, and I just think for public record, that needs to be out there for our providers to understand. And, uh, you know, we'd love to work with you and we want to help our providers. But that just needs to be clear in the public's mind. Thank you. Do you all wish to respond to that at all? Um, we did. Um, this uh, regulation here is related to the hearing program, but to address the dental uh, comments, we have been speaking with um, our dental community after the regulations were filed. We did increase rates specifically because we tied it, the um, increased services for adults we tied that to the fee schedule in um, an effort to uh, get dentists to provide those services. So we have given some raises on certain codes. What we're doing is trying to be very strategic. Rather than giving an across the board raise, we want to be able to promote preventive services and those uh, give increases to those codes that are actually gonna make a difference in the individuals that we serve in, in their um, oral health care. So, um, with the regs being bound deficient, we're still looking at um, all of our options going forward and following the process. Any other questions? Representative Gordon, Fraser Gordon. And I have a few questions, if I may. Please proceed. Okay. Um, thank you for bringing this forward. Um, it, as you know, it's very near and dear to my heart. So, but I do have a couple clarifying questions. Is this reg just in regards to hearing testing for adults, or is this also in order to provide technology um, when appropriate? This is also to provide technology such as hearing aids when appropriate. Okay. So. Um, so in the statement of emergency, um, it is said that over 900,000 Medicaid recipients could immediately benefit from the availability of audiology, dental, and visual coverage. I agree. Um, so however, in the, um, in the regulation review form under the economic impact, it states that this should cost about, just for the hearing, about $150,000 annually is what was estimated. Um, so I know the single unit cost, um, the limit is $800 per unit, which is $1,600 just for the technology before we even add on the fee schedule, which was established in 2006. So just doing that math, this will only help about 93 people. So I, I just want to make sure that we're comparing apples to apples, and that's why I asked that question about what coverages we're actually adding. And the 150000 is just state funds. Uh, that does not include the federal funds that we'll be drawing down in, for these services. And did you have additional? Uh, I was going to mention it's a, it's a $0.25 cent per member per month uh, increase. Uh, so it's, it, we have to filter that into the, the MCO capitation rate. So it's, it's just a, it's a little bit uh, fuzzier than, than just a direct cost comparison. Okay. Could you explain the match then as far as what the state's, what we're drawing down? From federal. Uh, I just want to ensure match. this is an important yeah, program. So, and I just want to make so, sure that it's funded uh, properly. Typically, um, it's about a 75% match rate that the federal government will pay 75%, and then uh, the state would be responsible for 25%. So we'd have to do the yeah. do the math on that. Yeah. I, yeah, Sorry, I'm not a. It, it's what, what we'll put into it will be a little bit different because the MCOs may expect to pay, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's less than just uh, the 900,000 people that, that they have coverage for it, it like, like insurance type coverage that, that we're, we're paying for. So we do, of course, expect a, a far smaller percentage of the, the population to, to access the services. 
Okay. One last question. Um, are there conversations with audiology fee schedule as well? And could you give an update on that? Because I believe it was 2006 the last time that it's been updated. We have been having some conversations uh, with our technical advisory committee um, on those rates. And again, we believe that these changes are just the very first step in amending the Medicaid program to bring it um, where it needs to be as far as reimbursement and services for our members. So we are having those conversations. And again, want to be very strategic in our um, increases or in our reimbursements for providers rather than doing that across the board raise. Where, are, um, where can we get the biggest bang for our buck, for example? What services, uh, preventive, which ones are gonna make the biggest impact rather than that across the board race? So those conversations are happening right now. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, couple, a comment and then a question. Uh, first comment is to Mrs. Lee. I just wanna let you know I did receive your email and I appreciate that, the res response. Um, we get a little busy up here sometimes and don't always get chance to respond to emails quickly uh, but I appreciate your response the as far back to the rates you know we have the expansion we have the expansion as one issue to me you know the rates another another issue and I know you've already touched on it but could you just at what phase are is the rate discussion is it in public comment I'm assuming there's a different discussion for each segment is that is that kind of how it's happening that is correct uh, the dental uh, increase for example has already happened it has been put into place the fee schedules have been adjusted is for that through, is that through ereg um our our um our fee schedules are tied to our regulation but we reference so for example each year we add or remove codes based on uh, federal um, coverage guidelines and we do not update our regulation each time we update our fee schedule. So, so I guess my main question that that gets to my point. This this reg, the reg we talked about last month, you know, we found it deficient. Um, if we eventually find that reg null and void, uh, will that impact your rate schedule, your new rate schedules? Well, we are following the process and we are examining um, all uh, avenues. Again, the rate increase was as direct result of those additional services for adults. So we would have to go back and reevaluate. I, I got options you. Are. So, so you're, t tell me if I'm wrong. Um, so you could, you could distinguish the two. If you, if you chose to, you could do a, a new e-reg for just the rates if, if you all chose to do that. Um, I don't think that we would have to do an e-reg for the rates. I think that you know we we could amend them again. This is contingent upon the adult services. We are um, the reason that we are going, uh, are, are the reason that we want to provide these services again. Workforce development, individuals who cannot see, who cannot hear, who don't have a nice smile, they're not entering the workforce because people don't want to interview them or they have um, stigma against them when they go for interviews. Again, we know that oral health is very important to overall health. Uh, it directly links to heart disease, uh, preterm deliveries. Getting those services to adults right now will prevent those, um, those diseases from progressing in the future and will save money. Uh, hearing, for example, it's, uh, it has been known, there have been studies that show that an individual who gets a hearing aid prior to a complete hearing loss is 18% less likely to develop, uh, to develop Alzheimer's. So again, we want, to, we want to invest in these services now for various reasons, but mainly to prevent future increased costs in these areas. Any other, do you have a comment? Uh, I just the the policy um, regs that we're in if if we if they were found permanently null and void then there are some services that would no longer exist and so th those would also be coming off the fee schedule as well. So it would be very important then to come back the following month with a new set of regs to reinstate those services after session. If you all choke, in other words, you you would have the flexibility the following month to uh, automatically reinstate those services through e through e reg. 
I need to have a little bit more of a conversation about that to, to understand. Gotcha. We're, we're, our doors are open. I think it's safe to say our doors are open on that. So any other questions from members? Seeing none. Thank you all. Thank you. That concludes this meeting. Uh, do we have any announcement? Uh, our next meeting is scheduled for April 11th at 1 p.m. <laughs> A lot of joy, a lot of joy. Any other questions or comments? Seeing none, this meeting's adjourned.